Let's, let's just not focus on, on Minnesota. Uh, let's hear what's happening around the Midwest, and I think that's important. Because I think what we're going to hear today is that there's relationships with Latinos and their state parties that are different than we have here. The populations are different than we have Wisconsin and Illinois. And so I decided to bring in the activists, the Latino conservatives here, that, uh, that can talk to us about how we, as a group, work closer together in the Midwest. And I think we need to do that. I think uh, that's going to be one of the things that will move us forward as we, as we do outreach, as we, as we try to work together and make sure that uh, Minnesota's out and, and the Midwest isn't left out of the mix. Let me introduce the panel. Of course, we know Nancy. You just heard Nancy. Thanks for that presentation. I want to go to that lake you go up, you know, whatever lake that was. And I'm kind of a city guy. I used to go to Phelan, and then I would say, I went up north, you know. I, well, yeah, I don't do up north. I'm kind of scared of bugs, you know, but uh, kind of a city guy. But there's nothing wrong with that, is there, folks? Yeah, North St. Paul. As far north I go. But it's fun there. It's really fun. Well, first of all, we reached out to um, a, unique, a unique politician and conservative who happens to live in Chicago, Angel Garcia. Angel. Imagine being a Latino Republican in Chicago. <laughs> That's why I said you gotta move fast. You know, don't run you over over there. But Angel is, is, is president of the Chicago Young Republicans, a nationally recognized award-winning club and serves on the Illinois Republican Party State Central Committee. You hear that? It's got a spot on the State Central Committee. Angel has worked on numerous local, state, and national campaigns. In addition, he served as chairman of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly of Cook County and is a political commentator for NBC Del Mundo. Angel has a JD from the John Marshall Law School and an MBA from the Brennan School of Business. He currently works as an attorney and was a candidate for Cook County clerk in 2010. Angel is a lifelong Chicago resident. Next day, Angel, our good friend Steve Orlando, they go down, they go up here together. And Steve, Steve lives in Plainville, Illinois. Got involved in politics at the age of 15 and was active through college at Northern Illinois University with the NIU College Republicans. Orlando has served as treasurer of the Federation of Illinois Young, uh, Illinois Young Republicans since 2009, as chairman of the Will County chapter of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly from 2009 to 2011. In that time, Steve built the largest, most effective county chapter in Illinois. Orlando reorganized the Illinois Republican National Hispanic Assembly in late 2011. Over the past years, Orlando's organization has hosted events with former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, rising star George P. Bush, and here's our favorite guy, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz. Yeah. Ted Cruz is, we're gonna talk about Ted Cruz in a minute. And, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, two of our friends from Minnesota. We, we wanted to include Minnesota, obviously. <laughs> uh, and uh, although, although I, I am chair of the uh, uh, Hispanic Republican Assembly and, and proud to be chair of uh, Minnesota, but Victor's been one of our co-founders, Victor Gomez. Okay. And um, um, again, he's one of the troopers. <laughs> he, he's one of our guys that, uh, that has stayed with us through thick and thin, uh, through uh, a dwindling membership to back back on the scene. And uh, that's what we like about uh, about working with Victor Gomez. Victor, it's great to have you here. And last but not least, our good friend Bob Quashes from Marshall, Minnesota. <laughs> and Bob is, uh, is, is, is chair of a real unique uh, organization, Café con Leche, Coffee with Cream, Republicans. Now, uh, their, their tag is they're a pro-immigration reform Republican group. Now, Bob and his group were way ahead of the curve. You know, immigration, being a Republican and being pro-immigration reform was not very popular a couple of years ago. We all know that a couple of years ago. That was not where we wanted to be. But Bob and his group, they were ahead of the curve. 
They do a lot of great things online. He has chapters all over the country. Uh, Fox Latino, all the major media, go to Bob and his group. We're talking about immigration reform. We're talking about issues in the Republican Party and how we work with the Latino community. So, uh, hidden away in Marshall, Minnesota, is Bob Quashes. Bob, thanks for being here. Well, again, we, we want to find out what's happening in, in, in other states and their uh, relationships with the state party. So, I'm going to ask Angel Garcia to uh, give us a, a minute or so why and how he turned Republican or he became Republican and in Chicago, the Windy City, how you managed to grow that young Republican club to 500 members. Give us the story, Angel. Um, so quickly, I, I think it's just a story of, of being uh, the son of immigrants. Uh, similar story, uh, parents worked hard. Uh, every time the Chicago uh, people came around to our businesses, it was always to get a nice kickback. Uh, so it was always a, a natural anti-government uh, feeling against my parents and generally uh, with immigrants. Uh, government's not here to help, uh, government hurts. So I think I carried that with me, went through college, uh, became a writer in college, and uh, I'll be honest, I had no idea I was a Republican. I just thought this was common sense. Uh, and then I was protested, they burned me in effigy at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, because I was a radical Hispanic. I was not supposed to say that these policies don't work or anything. So uh, I jumped into politics pretty quickly. Um, yeah, much to my surprise, I thought I was just doing common sense writing. Uh, I thought the National Review was a regular newspaper, not a conservative uh, magazine. Um, but you know, I learned quickly, and I learned to get a tough skin. And uh, you know, if you can survive uh, as an activist in college, where you know the world is so different, uh, you know, going to Chicago is a piece of cake. Uh, so that that was my quick, uh, you know, how I became a Republican. I just thought that that's what everyone was. And later, I was told, no, you're a Republican, and uh, you know. So I uh, wanted to be active. I uh, tried to join the state party, the Chicago party, uh, but sadly, uh, in the bigger areas, there really isn't a party to be had. Uh, you know, if you can't win elections there, it's difficult to get a good organization going in the, the city. Uh, so uh, luckily, I work with some people, young people, young professionals, marketing experts, uh, accountants, lawyers, and we started the Chicago Young Republicans. Uh, we put major money into it. We raised. Uh, $30,000 for a marketing campaign on trains and uh, bathroom stalls at clubs and bars, and it said, you know, join the Chicago Young Republicans, because we know numbers-wise, they're out there, right? So here in St. Paul, um, other cities, you know that raw numbers-wise, they're out there. Maybe percentage-wise, they're not, but raw numbers-wise, they're there. So we know, look, we know we have numbers there, uh, put money be behind it, marketing campaign, Facebook, uh, internet, uh, buses, go where the people are, and uh, we built it. And uh, you know, every couple of years we do uh, anywhere from thirty thousand to fifty thousand dollars in campaigning. Uh, that means working with donors, making sure the donors understand that this is something that's worth it. We can do similar with the Latino community. I can see something working there as well. And then earned media, uh, earned media, uh, getting smart, articulate, diverse people in front of the cameras, uh, making sure they know what to say. Uh, that's worth so much in advertising because uh, you know the left always portrays us as a bunch of racist, bigot, homophobes. Uh, very difficult to do that if all our uh, faces of the party are diverse and smart on the issues. Uh, you know, we don't have to lose our position, but uh, you know we just have to do a better job of uh, being creative and networking. Steve, thank you, Angel. Well, Steve, your your group is is uh, as we as we mentioned in, in your bio, one of the largest groups in Illinois. You're very active. Let me ask you: since the beginning of your organization, how have you been able to help campaigns of uh, individuals that come to your group, much like we have here? We have a lot of candidates here that are here to listen and learn. But the next step is to do the outreach. Give us a hint on how, how your group was able to help campaigns and some of the things you and activities you do there. I think the, that's a good question. Is this thing on? Yeah. All right, good. Um, 
years ago, the consensus was in the Republican candidates, all right, let's uh, just approach the, the Hispanic community in August before the November election and you know go to a few meetings and participate in a few things. Why isn't this working? And so over the past six, seven years, I really think that a lot of our uh, Republican elected office holders in Illinois get it. It's about around the year, off year election participation, attending meetings, getting to know people within the community, participating in the community fairs and the parades and all this and that. And uh, I really feel, obviously we've taken a pretty big hit uh, over the past, especially five years with uh, the, the president's uh, home state Obviously, wanting the people wanting to support their homegrown uh, candidate, uh, but thankfully he's not going to be on the ballot anymore. And so I really do think that we're turning. Uh, just knowing uh, Cook County is obviously the big county in the Chicago metro area, uh, but also in the neighboring counties, Will County, Page County, we've got a great network where we have the ear to a lot of the established uh, elected officials and the up and coming candidates, and uh, we work with them to translate the materials into Spanish. To, to help out however we can to get them uh, locked in to the community and making those uh, introductions, which it's their responsibility to take the ball and run with it, but we are there to help however we can. And especially in the past, uh, I'd say three years, I think we've really made some great strides. And we got it to the point where, leading up to 2014, I'm really excited about uh, uh, our Latino candidates coming out We've got, uh, just announced the other day, one of our top members of our Hispanic organization is running for lieutenant governor uh, with the governor candidate that's got a really good chance of winning. Her, her name is Evelyn Sanguinetti, and she's running with a gentleman named Bruce Rahner, who's one of four, and each of our four candidates for governor, I think are, are well qualified and are gonna be great, whoever makes it out of the primary. Uh, Illinois is gonna go Republican next year in the governor race. I guarantee you that right now. But also we've got uh, several members of ours that are running for state house races. We've got Romero Juarez uh, in the northwest suburban area. We've got Yvonne Bolton in the southwest suburban area. And so I think especially if we start getting our Republicans elected who happen to have Hispanic backgrounds, that's going to be the thing to show the community, hey, look, it's not just Democrats that are Latino. It's Republicans, too. And so we're in a really good position, and I'm really excited for the next uh, 13 months here, we're gonna have some good things happen. Well, that's one of the things that, that has to happen with, with Latino organizations. Yes, they're gonna assist your campaigns, make the introductions, make sure that you can meet the right people, be at the right events, and when you go to the event, make sure you're gonna get a return on investment. But I like the fact that you're spawning candidates, that you're growing, that's our job. I'm going to switch over to uh, Wisconsin, and then we'll bring the Minnesota guys in. I'm going to switch over to Nancy now. Uh, Nancy and I have been friends for many, many years. Uh, I know that her, her, uh, her community uh, has, um, has a lot of organizations that are conservative. Um, my good friends at the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee, of uh, Wisconsin, a uh, very good group. Uh, Nancy, give us, give us an idea of politics in uh, Wisconsin. Um, how do you see the Latino vote uh, in the future, uh, your relationship with, with the Governor Walker and the party? Um, sure, yeah, we don't have a lot going on in Wisconsin, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I think one of the things that I think um, some of you heard already today, and, and Rick certainly alluded to that, is, you know, I think that our governor really shows the benefits of having a positive, ongoing, sustained relationship with the Latino community and how does that help? I mean, he really, from his early days of working um, at the state as a state representative to his time as county executive um, and certainly into uh, his gubernatorial um, national headline uh, stint, you know, he has always had strong relationships with the Hispanic community, uh, both from a policy advisement standpoint and, and some of it, you know, we've not necessarily always been on the same side of the aisle with some of the things that we want. You know, for instance, if you poll 
probably every single Hispanic in the state, whether it's Republican or Democrat, they're going to tell you they absolutely want to see a version of the DREAM Act in Wisconsin and ask the governor to take a lead on that. And sometimes he's going to have to give hard stances and says he can't do that for whatever reason. But the dialogue is there and um, there is continued ongoing discussion about that, of what can and cannot happen. You know, understand that just because you have to give negative news sometimes, it doesn't mean that you don't give no news. That's even much more insulting to that group of people that have been there advising you. If there's going to be something in, because these guys are on the front lines, Hispanics, we're on the front lines with our communities every day, something sometimes towing the unpopular line. And so I need to know that you, you have my back and, and I have yours as much as possible. So when there's going to be something negative in the headlines, giving us a heads up is the same thing that we would do on the reciprocity side. So I'd say that put, that, put that out there as well. But I think, uh, you know, doing the, um, going through the recall election, which was very, <laughs> very interesting to say the least, but certainly you had um, a group of um, Hispanics strongly in the unionized Democratic camp, but there was a strong group of especially uh, business owners, Hispanic business owners that were very, very public um, with what they did and said um, it was from their pocketbook to um, you know, doing some of the earned media pieces, et cetera, that were out there for the governor. And I think certainly the results of that uh, recall election show where uh, Wisconsin stands or firmly behind the governor and some of the things that he's doing. Um, and Hispanics and the Hispanic vote played a strong role in that. So um, you know, that kind of shows the payoff um, when you do things right, and again, right doesn't always mean that it's a 100%, you know, even if you pull this group here, we're going to be on, you know, different slices of an issue just among, you know, every single table. And so I think that that's a natural when it comes to politics. The question is, is, um, is that ongoing dialogue exists there with those groups to be able to really, uh, it, you know, get the, the positive results of those relationships. Well, I understand too, Nancy, that it, it, with, the, with the Republican Party of Wisconsin, there's a seat at the table for Latino. Donors. Absolutely. There has always been a presence, sometimes formal and sometimes informal um, ways. And the, way, and the, the reason I say that is that there are Republican, Hispanic Republican groups organized within the state that have had a seat at the table, and sometimes it has been somebody else who um, is strong in community presence, like currently um, we have Camille Solberg, who is part of um, our senator, uh, senator's administrative staff that is holding that seat. Um, we also have a variety of, you know, one thing that I think is unique that we have found that works for us, and um, if you remember from what I spoke about, it's to address sometimes that tuning it out. You know, we have groups in Wisconsin called Hispanic Heritage Council that don't have the word Republican in them, but are conservative organizations, specifically for that reason, to help tone down that tuning off part on it so we can start those conversations and start talking about similarities. So that's um, one of the things that I would say. All of those have strong ties to what's going on in the party. And you know, you guys as elected officials out there, I would challenge you and say, you know, who are you talking to in the community? And you need to really, really understand that lay of the land. Um, you need to understand who you're getting advised from. Maybe somebody that's fantastic but um, and well-meaning and very conservative, but it might not be giving you the information that you need uh, to, you know, best stay connected with that community. So I would say get to know that as well and understand. And that, that comes from talking to not just one or two people, that comes from talking to 20 to 25 people and understanding how those circles and social circles and networking circles exist within the, the Hispanic community. Thank you, Nancy. That, that, that was well said. And very important. I know that, that, that is a hard-working conservative group in Milwaukee and, and Wisconsin, but you have a seat at the table, and that's important, as, as does Angel with the Republican Party owner. He's on the State Central Committee. A seat at the table. I think we have to we can keep talking about that. It's important. That's how we form the, the relationships. That's how we go out to, out to our community to say we have a seat at the table. We're in the leadership positions. And I think that's something that, that, that soon should be considered. Now, 
Um, before I introduce uh, Bob Quashes, I, I, I want to uh, uh, go briefly to immigration reform and to a very important meeting um, that I went to uh, a few years ago in Miami. It was uh, a group that uh, Norm Coleman has uh, put together, the Hispanic Leadership Network. Of course, you know Norm Coleman has up the American Action Network, which is uh, uh, very active in, in conservative uh, uh, campaigns and conservative issues. And um, our speaker for that day was Ephraim Malinago, who was the Lieutenant Governor of California under Schwarzenegger. And there was a, a, I would say, the GOP leadership at this event in Miami, from Conan, from all the, the big states with, with high Latino populations, uh, McCain, name it, they were there. And here was the message from, from Lieutenant Governor Maldonado. He said, we in California have probably one quarter of all the Latinos in the country, many of them undocumented. I want to tell you, as I'm going to repeat it three times, they do not want amnesty. I said it three times. They do not want amnesty. They will take a working visa. Because every time one of our Republicans come up with a immigration reform, we're, we're screaming and yelling, you're, you're going to give them amnesty. Well, you can't give something to people that don't want it. So let's, let's remember that. They do not want amnesty. Let's, 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 if we take anything back when we leave this meeting, remember that. That's something to be forced on them, obviously for the vote. The Democrats would like to get, get the amnesty and get these folks voting. Well, that's, 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 that's that issue. But let's remember that. And, and, and when I say Bob and his group, Cafe Colette, you were ahead of the curve, you were ahead of the curve. Bob, tell me, obviously you're not Latino, but you know, I've been, in my career in politics, my best friends have been Anglos, my mentors, the friends that I've worked with. And somehow, somewhere, there's, 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 there's a, an effort to put a wedge between Latinos and the Anglo community. And I am totally against that, but Bob, give, give us an idea how the group started. You're the founder, you're the president. Your little background, you're a marshal, and how this all started. Well, first of all, I've been a Republican activist. I've been a candidate. I've been a VP of the treasurer for about 25 years. And uh, about eight years ago, I decided to uh, marry a woman from Honduras, whom I, I met on vacation. And uh, navigating through the whole process of trying to bring her here, dysfunctional system we had. It was just it was just a nightmare. I ended up getting Norm Coleman involved uh, for something very basic. Just an interview at an embassy. Had to be, we had to obtain a visa within <coughs> three months of getting a petition approved. The backlog was already four months. So before you even started, you already missed deadlines. And, and this is typical experiences that many legal immigrants are running into. And if you're not a family member or a citizen or a highly skilled professional, Basically, there is no line to, to stand in. There is no proverbial line. There's a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of Republicans don't understand immigration well. And what's happened is there, there's some groups, I would call them population reduction progressives. They have deep ties to zero population growth, to Planned Parenthood. They want to, re, they want to slash all immigration. Their number one tool is disinformation. And when there's a void of knowledge about immigration, these groups fill that with myths and stereotypes about immigrants. Their agenda, they, they want to slash legal immigration by 75%, and they want strict in, enforcement. So basically, they want to stand the door shut of immigration. So there's a lot of misleading, confusing information. So as, as a long-term activist who successfully navigated the, uh, the legal immigration system, I start to see a lot of, a lot of disconnects. I, so a lot of Republicans do not have a good understanding of immigration. I saw a lot of disinformation being thrown out there to sort of build a wedge between Republicans and immigrants. You've got liberals that want to define Republicans as anti-immigrant and anti-Latino. It's a phrase I, I want you to remember, when, uh, I want you to take away from this. I heard this from a Latino Republican activist in Virginia. Stupid is letting your opposition define you. And when you, when you don't engage with the demographic and you don't ask for their vote, but your opposition does, and your opposition is feeding them all sorts of disinformation about you, 
they don't hear from you, guess who's going to win that battle? So liberals and the liberal media have been trying to define Republicans as anti-immigrant and anti-Latino. And one of the things I discovered when I first started getting involved with this, I started looking at polls and said, well, what do Republicans really think about immigration reform? We even before it, it came into vogue recently, I can point you to a poll from May of 2011 from Pew Research. They divided, the, the sam groups they sampled, they divided into different ideological groupings. And, and the three that correspond best to Republicans are staunch conservatives, uh, Main Street conservatives, and libertarians. Well, staunch conservatives, this might surprise you, on the, sub, on the question about immigration reform, including a path to uh, citizenship, were split right down the middle, 49-49. Main Street Republicans for immigration reform. Libertarian Republicans were for immigration reform. So I, what I see has happened, you have a, a small minority of Republicans who are very shrill about this issue and make a lot of comments that are very intense. The media picks up on this. So what Latinos hear, when they watch the news media, they hear Steve King talking about the uh, dreamers with calves the size of cantaloupes. You hear some of the most outrageous comments, and you know, they, they're newsworthy because it's coming from a congressman, but is Steve King, uh, is he a party leader? Does he even hold a chairmanship in the House? No, he doesn't. I mean, he's just one isolated congressman who has some very intense, uh, very shrill views on this. But if other Republicans don't speak out, guess what? He's the face of the party. It's Steve Kane and Russell Pierce. They're a small minority of Republicans and are not representative of the whole party. But if somebody else doesn't speak out, guess what? They become the face of the party. So one of the things that we wanted to do when we formed uh, Kathy Cohn Lecce is we wanted to present a different face of the party. We want to help one, we want to help the party have a better understanding of issues like uh, immigration. We want to help the party engage better and win more Latino voters over. We also want Latinos to see a different face. We, we don't want them to see Steve King as being Mr. Republican, you know, because he is he's just one of you know one of many voices. So we wanted to sort of change the whole paradigm. You know, liberals trying to define this as something that we're not. Uh, Latinos getting a different perception of Republicans. And so we decided also to define ourselves as pro-immigrant Republicans rather than by your ethnicity. We are, we are predominantly Hispanic, but we don't limit ourselves in that way. And that way people who are passionate about immigration reform can uh, feel welcome. They feel like, well, if you define yourself as a Latino, as soon as you get somebody who's not Latino, you say, well, I don't fit with that group. And so you're not going to get them involved. So we defined ourselves a little bit differently. And that's kind of uh, how we got to where we are. And we've uh, been growing. We've got chapters in Florida, Georgia, Virginia. We're about to announce one in Massachusetts. It'll be our first in New England. Oklahoma, Texas, Illinois, Minnesota, Arizona, and California. So it's been a very good time. Make sure that uh, before we leave, uh, that, that people know how to reach your group and and, uh, and then be able to interact with your group because it's a very significant group. And again, you get major media. You're one of the go-to groups, and it's and it's it's great messaging because we have a Republican group that's pro-immigration reform, and you get a lot of ink. We love you for that. I think it makes sense. Now let's go to the, let's go to the Minnesota uh, Hispanic Assembly. Um, we've had our, I would say, uh, to be very candid, and, and once again we have some of our board members, Adolfo Cardona's here, uh, Frank Mendez, Carmen Robles is with him, Maria de La Paz, um, all great friends of, uh, of, of our, uh, our group. Our group's been around 17 years now. Um, um, I ran into, um, you know, Latino voter outreach isn't new. Uh, it, it, uh, we, we ran into uh, uh, Rudy Boswich and reminded Rudy of Hispanics for Boswich. Oh yeah, and it was a very active group. And we were doing a lot, I remember what we had Rudy in the parade, and he had, he had that same sport coat on, but we had him in the parade. It was, it was, and it was hot outside, it was in the summer, but he had the camel, the camel hair. And I said, kind of hot, isn't it Rudy? Mucho calor, but anyway. Um, love Rudy. And, 
You know, Rudy felt the energy. I, 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 I really love campaigning with Rudy. When Arnie Carlson used to be Republican, remember Arnie was Republican? <laughs> now let's look at what Arnie Carlson. I, I think Arnie Carlson really hit on one of the essence of who Latinos are. Arnie Carlson called us, he was pitching vouchers at the time as governor, vouchers. And he was going nowhere. You know where he found a home? Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. 500 Latinos stayed after mass to listen and support Arnie Carlson. We're looking for issues that we can reform relations with Latinos. We don't have to look any further than education. I'll be asking my panel on that. But the history of our organization has been one where immigration reform and just the idea and, and the, the contentious issue that it is really, really hurt our membership because there were some vicious attacks on Latinos if you were a Republican and you were seen as anti-Mexican, anti-Latino. And it was vicious. There was the Facebooks and there was the radio and there was the the, the, the rumors and the, and I, I, I was part of that. And, uh, you know, I, to be honest with you, I love it. I, I, I love, I love being in battle. So it didn't affect me. And, uh, but I was very involved with, uh, with Governor Plenty. And I was seen as a racist and that type of thing. But, um, but other folks were intimidated by it, some of our membership. They're still conservative. When they go in the booth, they're going to vote Republican, but they're not as active as we were. And there's still some fallout there. But that doesn't keep us from organizing events like this. It doesn't keep us from wanting to work with you. And we're going to be talking about that as we go um, in our last session here. But um, Victor, uh, let's, let's, let's get an idea from you. Um, you were actually one, one of our, one of our, our, um, our, our commitments that we would have Latino candidates. Tell us a little bit about that race for, for, uh, for city council. When we entered you as a Republican Latino, and we actually got you endorsed, we actually got, actually got you to the general election. Give us something on that. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, it was 1998, actually. It was a little bit ago. But I uh, actually ran against the now mayor, Chris Coleman. Uh, I was uh, recruited by. Uh, Rick and uh, then Mayor Norm Coleman and uh, the Chamber of Commerce to be a candidate for that election. Um, I was also a founding member of the Hispanic Republican Assembly of Minnesota uh, and uh, the National Committeeman uh, for the Minnesota Young Republicans. Uh, much like these guys over here, I was a college Republican who went to the University of Colorado in Boulder. <laughs> uh, not a popular place to be a college Republican, uh, particularly a Hispanic college Republican. And uh, so I, I relate to a lot of those <coughs> stories that you guys have mentioned, uh, the burning of an effigy that's actually occurred for me as well. <laughs> um, you know, where are these devils up here? Um, but we ran a, a, an extremely um, effective campaign. Uh, we lost by uh, less than five points to Chris. Uh, I was the first endorsed Republican candidate, endorsed Republican purely Republican, not independent Republican or anything of that nature. So we, I'm extremely proud of, of, of that accomplishment. Um, and uh, we ran a top-notch campaign. Um, we, sorry about that, guys. We actually outraised Chris Coleman by about $20,000 for that campaign as well. Um, we, uh, we, uh, I personally knocked every single door in the district for Ward 2, which this was a part of it. Uh, three times myself, uh, we touched every door uh, approximately five times with all of our mailings and everything else. Um, that's one of the things we want to talk about. We have these grassroots organizations that we just don't connect well with always. I was also uh, had the opportunity and the privilege to be the director of outreach for coalitions. Uh, for the Republican Party a couple of years ago. It was a project that only lasted nine months uh, due to some funding, but the good thing about that was in that nine months, 
I more than doubled the size of our coalition groups and, and the membership of those coalition groups. And it was done, one handshake at a time, one relationship at a time, and that's what it takes. That's what it's always gonna take. The problem with, with Republican Party outreach and, and diversity groups and community groups, and particularly, in particular, the, the Hispanic community, isn't our brand. It's that they don't know our brand. We don't market it well. We don't have that campaign that goes out and talks about it. Just like President Ronald Reagan said, Hispanics are Republicans. They just don't know it yet. We're not telling them where our shared values are because they're there. Groups like what Ralph Reed are doing with the Faith and Freedom Coalition, working with the churches and drilling down and creating those voter guides that are saying, hey, look, these are your Christian values. These are what you believe in hard work, in discipline, in, 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 in your anti-abortion, things of those natures. These individuals that you're electing on the other side of the aisle don't represent any of those values. These guys are bamboozling you, and why are you continuing to vote for them? That's what we have to communicate. That's one of the things that Rick and I did as co-chairs of the Bush campaign that was so aggressive and so successful in getting Bush reelected as well, was the micro-targeting of specific groups and communities and neighborhoods on those shared issues and saying, this is why, this is where we agree. This is why we should be working together. This is why you should be voting for us. If we do that, we don't let them put us in a box and define us. We don't let them divide us. And it gives us an opportunity to, de to define ourselves and create those relationships and garner those votes for the long haul. Our problem is we've abdicated that responsibility by not creating and maintaining those relationships. Just like a marriage, if you don't maintain those relationships, they go away. They turn bad. Yeah. So we need to do a better job of that. And that's why I want to thank Rick for putting on this conference. He deserves a big hand. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think that's very important what you said. Uh, when you're getting the message out, the Viva Bush campaign, we won the Latino vote on the east side and the west side. That's important. We won the Latino vote because the message was there. Opportunity, patriotic message. We can do that again. And I think we have the candidates. We have a great list of candidates come up here in 2014. And together, as we start the journey today, I think we can get back and build relationships. These are good people. They're hardworking. These are our people that we can form relations with. Let me, let me do this before we go on break. I'm going to ask each of you to give our friends here one bit of advice that's important in outreach. And we're going to start with Angel. Angel, you said something last night after we had our fourth margarita. I can't remember what the hell it was. No, we only had three. But I, it was the beer that got me, no. But no, you mentioned last night about the relationship and, and, and your messaging that I think is important. All right. So, so two things, right? Message and messenger. So uh, quickly, um, a freebie uh, for message is uh, education, uh, just demographics-wise. Uh, Latinos are younger. Uh, they're at the stage of their lives where they're having more kids. Uh, and they're raising kids, so more than any other group, uh, education is more important, so then you can go vouchers, charter schools, uh, whatever is the issue in your state. Uh, but demographic-wise, uh, education is key compared to others because just of, of, of the components there. Uh, two, messenger. Uh, we use this with great effect in Chicago. Uh, we are not letting them define us uh, because we are finding good messengers that are out there. The media loves young people. They love attractive people. Uh, don't tell me you cannot find uh, great messengers for your organization. Again, you're not changing what you believe in. We're not changing our core values as Republicans. Uh, what we are doing is doing a little bit of marketing and making sure that our messengers uh, reflect uh, the township, reflect the county, reflect uh, what they say we are not, uh, because we can find uh, articulate 
female Republicans. We can't find uh, different, different bases. Um, this is just you know, marketing 101. Uh, and with that goes relationship with the press. There is a huge opportunity in the Latino market, huge Spanish speaking market. Uh, it's like back in the 80s when there was only ABC, NBC, and CBS, and that's the only way you can get your information. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but in Spanish speaking communities, it's still just Univision or Telemundo, and uh, maybe your two or four radio stations and newspapers. Uh, so if you can get a good relationship, and you don't even have to hire them right now, although I would say put some money behind it, but get Spanish speaking interns as part of your county board or township. Uh, because it's there. There is very limited Spanish speakers out there we're getting our butts kicked uh, because the Democrats do have those people there. Uh, so it's their message against nothing. Or an English Spanish speaking Republican with the translator sound bites over it, which looks horrible and it's not even a live feed. It's the picture, it's a very horrible picture of our spokesperson with uh, you know print on top. So find these people, um, you know, message and messenger. Steve. One thing I just want to reiterate, and I mentioned this earlier, 90% of this, 80% of this, is just showing up and making yourself available to start building a relationship. Um, a little quick story. Um, Aaron Schock is a congressman from Western Illinois, Peoria area. When he first ran for state representative, he was, what, 23 years old? Going back to 2004. Well, his district in Peoria uh, is very diverse. Now down there, it's not so heavily Latino, it's heavily black. He spent time in the churches getting to know people and made a genuine effort. They rewarded him with giving 25% of the vote to a Republican state representative candidate. He just made the effort. I, I keep hearing, or I have heard in the past, certain candidates just willing to write off certain, whole segments of a voting block. I'd say don't do it. I'd say it's worth the time to reach out to the Latino, Asian, and black market. Absolutely, don't, don't count anybody out. Because uh, any one vote you get from a traditional Democrat uh, to vote for a Republican, that's a net two in your favor. I like those odds. Victor. Yeah, you know, we know the old political adage, the world is ruled by those who show up. And the world is also ruled by those who show up and aren't afraid to speak the truth. And we need to do that more effectively. We've seen all the numbers and all the data, um, but just being realistic, we can make a difference in those tight races. Look at what a greater percentage of work and just outreach to the Hmong community in Minnesota or the Hispanic community would have made in the difference for North Senate race. Look how tight that race was. Mark Kennedy gave Rick and I credit for winning at approximately about 500 votes when he won in Congress as well because we had a bilingual, multilingual campaign to get him out there and win that race as well. These are the things that can be that razor's edge to make a difference. But we've got to do it. We've got to spend some money and get out there and have that marketing campaign, have that, those lit pieces, do the micro-targeting so that we can show these individuals from these various different communities that we share these values that we are lockstep with each other and that we should work together and they should elect us. Bob. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the advertising and the engagement of Spanish language media is very important. I understand that uh, Obama outspent Romney on Spanish language media something like 12 to 1. And like I said earlier, you know, stupid is letting your opposition define him. A lot of that advertising was defined in Mitt Romney by just one comment that he made, completely ignoring the rest of his position. Uh, the other thing that I would stress, and a couple of great quotes from Marco Rubio <coughs> about immigration, one is, tone matters. If you come across as shrill, that can really be perceived as being anti-Latino. And, and liberals and Democrats will, they'll take advantage of that. They'll take little snippets of comments and they'll play them over and over. Uh, the other comment, that, the, the other quote from Marco Rubio is, when they think you're trying to deport their grandmother, uh, they're not going to listen to the rest of the message. And immigration is a gateway issue. How you talk about that issue it has a great deal to do with how you're perceived. And it goes back to Nancy's comment about that tuning out process. But over 80% of Latinos are either immigrants themselves or they're one to two generations removed. So it's a, it's a personal issue for many. 
you know, it's, it's a gateway issue. So it's very important to learn how to talk about it, to be careful about what terms you use, and, and especially your tone. Now, Bob, as, as we, Bob, as we move along, you know, we're going to feel free to some of our candidates, if they can contact you and work with you on, on some things that's important to yeah, especially you being in Marshall in that area. Thank you very much, Bob. Nancy? Okay, I'll say R C S. So first one, R, relationships. And a, a successful relationship is defined as both people getting things out of it. So that means that the relationship that you have with a lot of um, a lot of your Hispanic conservative organizations needs to work both ways. They do need to sit at the table. They need to be there not just at election time about candidates, they need to be there about policy. They need to be there about everything that's going on year round 24 seven. So first one, relationships. The next one, C, candidates. It is going to change the face of the party the more Hispanic candidates that we can go out there. I can tell you, us on the front line, we are combing through and looking for conservative Hispanics encouraging them, putting together schools for them, getting them invested with the party. The more that uh, other groups within the conservative party can help with that process, help them get funneled with backers, help them get funneled with um, dollars in a meaningful way, help them get funneled with support staff, that is going to go a long, long way. That's gonna help, it's all, a rising tide raises all boats. And the last one, S, social media. We have to, have to, have to use social media, digital media much more effectively out there on the streets as a way to communicate, as a way to build our databases. And that is something that is going to make you much more effective. It lets the, um, Hispanics are utilizing, especially mobile technology, far outpacing any other demographic, including Caucasian demographics. So understanding that and the fact that it gives you that specific targeting ability and utilizing that correctly is going to be very beneficial. Thank you, Nancy. Now, two things before we go on break. Um, I'm gonna throw my two cents in here. here here's, a, here's, here's my pet peeve. It's been for many years my pet peeve. Cinco de Mayo. Get a Republican candidate. He spends his $300, he's in the parade. As soon as that parade's over, he's gone. I gotta get going, I, I, can, I gotta get over the plane. <laughs> I'm going to be in a diner here in five minutes, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Somebody call me a racist in the parade, Jesus. What a crowd, you know, a tough crowd. You know? <laughs> right? I said, no, 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 we don't want you in the parade anymore, Republicans. We want you with a booth. Yeah. We want you with a booth. <laughs> and we don't want the candidate there for 10 minutes because he's on his way to other events. There's only one seat with a mile. We want you there for five hours. Yep. You'd be surprised when you're talking about education. You're going to make relationships. We had a booth on Lake Street, signed up 400 Latinos for school choice. Found it, 400. Get a booth. No more parades. Don't, don't even go to the parade. Get the booth. Okay, if I hear anybody, if I see any Republican in that parade, they don't have a booth. Woe is you. <laughs> we're, not, we're not marching with you either, so that's a little bit. This, so this, this one here, I think you'll fully understand. I had a great opportunity at the Western Republican Leadership Conference because of my association with the, with the uh, uh, Hispanic uh, Coalition leadership. I was able to get back in room with Romney's people before the debate. Here's what I told his people. Romney was out there. When they ask you the immigration question, and they will, and they did, and we messed it up, everyone on the stage messed it up. Here's what you say. Before I answer that question, let me tell you, Latinos have been a proud part of this country since day one. Whoa. And they have been, not in the history books, in Los Angeles and San Francisco didn't happen by accident. That wasn't the Swedes that came over. <laughs> we've been there. We fought in every war. And we've been, we've been a, a part of the growth of this country since day one. And they are hard-working people. But Romney was saying this, looking into the camera. He said, but today, we're here to talk about undocumented. It's another issue. But I wanted to tell, I wanted to tell America that first. 
How about that going over? Yeah. What, 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 he never said a word. He didn't use it. He didn't use it. They didn't want to use it. They were intimidated with it. And that's, again, who we are. Republicans were intimidating <laughs> in each other, so they couldn't say that. And what is it? Nothing but the truth. Yeah. So let's start using that when we're talking. Yeah. To, uh, yeah, and, 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 you're, and you're talking about the history, and you know the history. It's a great messaging for us. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go on break right now. We're going to go back upstairs. We've got coffee. We've got coke. We've got water. We're going to be back down here at uh, 1235 sharp because Janet Byhoffer doesn't want anybody late. You know, Janet? <laughs> well, don't be late, baby. You can, okay? Is Mark Jefferson here, too? Um, yeah. yeah, Mark Jefferson from the RNC, ladies and gentlemen, he's back here. Mark Jefferson, thank you. Uh, Janet and Mark, I'm going to give you the RNC update, starting back here at 1235. And then we've got panels right after, so get upstairs, have some coffee, and we'll talk soon. Yeah, your room is secure here, yeah. You can leave it here. Thank you.